Hey guys, uh, sorry it's been a little while. Life has been a little crazy. Um, just because I realized I haven't said it, I apologize to anyone who speaks French that I am butchering so many of these French words and names. Uh, I do my best. I'm not great, but I do my best. So uh, here we are, the Count of Monte Cristo, chapter five, the deputy Procure de Roy. <laughs> Again, I apologize. In one of the old mansions built by Puget in the Rue du Grand Cour, opposite the Fountain of Medusa, another betrothal feast was being celebrated on the same day and at the same hour as that which took place in the humble inn. There was, however, a great difference in the company present. Instead of members of the working class and soldiers and sailors, there were to, was to be seen the flower of Marseille society, former magistrates who had registered their office under the usurper's reign, old officers who had deserted their post to join the Conde's army, Conde's army, young men in whom their families had kindled a hatred of the men whom five years of exile were to convert into a martyr and 15 years of restoration into a demigod. The guests were still at table. Their heated and excitable conversation betrayed the passions of the period, passions which in the South had been so much more terrible and unrestrained during the past five years, since religious hatred had been added to political hatred. The emperor, king of the Isle of Elba, after having led sovereign away over one half of the world, now reigning over five or six thousand souls, after having heard long live Napoleon uttered by a hundred and twenty million subjects and in ten different languages, the emperor was regarded as a man that was lost to the throne of France forever. The magistrates recounted political blunders, the military offers discussed Moscow and Leipzig, the ladies aired their views on his divorce from Josephine. It was not in the downfall of the man that these royalists rejoiced and gloried, but rather in the annihilation of the principle, for it seemed to them that they were awakening from a dreadful nightmare and were about to enter upon a new life. An old man, the Marquis of saint Moran, wearing the cross of St. Louis, rose and proposed the health of King Louis XVIII. The toast, recalling the exiled but peace-loving King of France, elicited an enthusiastic and almost poetic response. Glasses were raised after the English fashion, and the ladies, taking their bouquets from their dresses, strewed the table with flowers. Ah, said the Marquis de saint Moran, a woman with a forbidding eye, thin lips, and, an, and an aristocratic and elegant bearing despite her fifty years. If those revolutionists were here who drove us out of our old castles, which they bought for a mere song, and which we left them to conspire against each other during the reign of terror, they would have to have to own that true devotion was on our side. We attached ourselves to a crumbling monarchy. They, on the contrary, worshipped the rising sun and made their fortunes while we lost all we possessed. They would be compelled to own that our king was truly, truly Louis the well-beloved to us, while their usurper has never been more to them than Napoleon the accursed. Don't you agree with me, De Villefort? What did you say, madam? I must crave your pardon. I was not listening to the conversation. Leave the young people alone, interposed the old gentleman who had proposed the toast. They're thinking of their approaching wedding, and naturally they have more interesting subjects of conversation than politics. I am sorry, mother, said a beautiful fair-haired girl with eyes of velvet floating in a pool of mother of pearl. I will give up Monsieur de Villefort for you, for I have see been monopolizing him for some few minutes. Monsieur de Villefort, my mother is speaking to you. I am at your service, madame, if you would be kind enough to repeat your question, Monsieur de Villefort said. You are forgiven, René, said the Marquise, with a smile of tenderness that one hardly expected to see on that dry, hard face. I was saying, Villefort, that the Bonapartists had neither our conviction, nor our enthusiasm, nor our devotion. No, madame, but they had a fanaticism to take the place of all other, those other virtues. Napoleon is the moment of the West to all those plebeian but highly ambitious people. He is not only a legislator and a master, he is a type, the personification of equality. Equality, exclaimed the Marquise. Napoleon, the personification of equality. Do you know, Villefort, what, that what you say has a very strong revolutionary flavor? But I excuse you, one cannot expect the son of a gridiron to be quite free from the spice of the old leaven. 
A deep crimson suffused the countenance of Villefort. It is true that my father was a groin gro gro <laughs> madame, but he did not vote for the king's death. My father was an equal sufferer with yourself during the reign of terror, and he well nigh lost his head on the same scaffold which saw your father's head fall. True, said the Marquise, but they would have mounted the st scaffold for reasons diametrically opposed, the proof being that whereas my family have all adhered to the exiled princes, your father lost no time in rallying to the new government, and that of our c citizen Nottier had been a gr Girondin, Count Nottier became a senator. Mother, said Renée, you know we agreed not to discuss such painful reminiscences any more. I quite agree with Mademoiselle de saint Marin, de Villefort replied. For my own part, I have discarded not only the views, but also the name of my father. My father has always been, and possibly still is, a Bonapartist, and bears the name of Nottier. I am a royalist, and style myself de Villefort. Well said, Villefort, the Marquise replied. I have always urged the Marquise to forget the past, but I have never been able to prevail upon her to do so. I hope you will be more fortunate than I. Very well, then, the Marquise rejoined. Let it be agreed that we forget the past. But, Villefort, should a conspirator fall into your hands, remember that there will be so many more eyes watching you since it is known that you come of a family which is perhaps in league with the conspirators. Alas, madam, Villefort replied, my profession, and especially the times in which we live, compel me to be severe. I have already had several political prosecutions which have given me the opportunity of proving my convictions. Unfortunately, we have not yet done with such offenders. Don't you think so? The Marquise inquired. I am afraid not. Napoleon on the Isle of Elba is very near to France. His presence there, almost in view of our coasts, stimulates the hopes of his partisans. At this moment, a servant entered and whispered something into his ear. Villefort, excusing himself, left the table, returning a few minutes later. Renée, he said as he looked tenderly on his betrothed, who would have a lawyer for her husband? I have no moment to call my own. I am even called away from my betrothal feast. Why are you called away? The girl asked anxiously. Alas, if I am to believe what they tell me, I have to deal with a grave charge which may very well lead to the scaffold. How dreadful, cried Renée, turning pale. It appears that a little Bonapartist plot has been discovered, Villefort continued. Here is a letter of denunciation. And he read as follows. The Procureur de Roy is hereby informed by a friend to the throne and to religion that a certain Edmond Dantes, mate of the Farion, which arrived this morning from Smyrna after having touched at Naples and Porto Ferraro, has been entrusted by Moat with a letter for the usurper, and by the usurper with a letter for the Bonapartist party in Paris. Corroboration of this crime can be found on arresting him, for a said for the said letter will be found either on him or at his father's house or in his cabin on board the ferial. But, Rene said, this letter is addressed to the Procureur de Roy and not to you and is moreover anonymous. You are right, but the Procureur de Roy is absent, so the letter has been handed to his secretary who has been instructed to open all correspondence. On opening this one, he sent for me and not finding me gave orders for the man's arrest. Then the culprit is already arrested, the Marquise said. You mean the accused person, Rene made answer. Then turning to, do, to Villefort, where is the unfortunate man? He is at my house. Then away, my dear boy, said the Marquis. Do not neglect your duty in order to stay with us. Go where the king's service calls you. And that is the end of chapter five. I will see you guys next time.